about two years before I was not the person who said, $15 for a drink? Do you know what that could buy in Afghanistan? <laughs> you know, I, was, I was super not fun at a party at that point. <laughs> But that adrenaline, that sense of adrenaline lifestyle was something that you felt familiar with, Tina. I mean, in the in smallest a, in a small scale way, way you know, because uh, uh, when you try to do something like this, you think, okay, well, if this is a character, what, what do I have in common? What do I not have in common? Of what, how can I relate to this? And for me, the, the smallest scale way to compare it to working at Saturday Night Live in terms of a job where you throw yourself in completely, you, you use it as an excuse to... Uh, avoid any like boring parts of your life. You're like, I can't go to my cousin's wedding because I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> I'm very busy, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, and so that and that was how I tried to relate to it. Yeah. Um, and and Robert, did you have that same sense as well? I found it very interesting, and, and yeah, sure, I, I think that's the closest I've ever come to that in terms of being sort of all in on something and, and the kind of adrenaline of a live show, but I mean, that doesn't, I, <laughs> doesn't compare in any way. Not even uh, slightly, but. Yeah, um, which is why, yeah. Uh, but we, but we risk embarrassment. Oh. <laughs> uh, not, not the writers. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. Um, <laughs> but I did find that a very compelling part of, of Kim's narrative, which is this, it's addictive, you're so important. <laughs> and you're, not to mention the pure adrenaline that you're getting, and more than one person I spoke to, and maybe you talked about this as well, Kim, I apologize in the book, but that addiction of not having to deal, being addicted to not having to live your boring real oh, life. Oh yeah, totally, totally, yeah. And you don't, I mean, people take, you don't have to do your laundry. You don't have to worry about, like, shopping. Um, you know, you don't have to deal with any of that stuff. You know, you don't have to really deal with, like, your personal life so much. Yeah, you don't have to go to your, like, boyfriend's yeah. work party. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you don't have to go to anyone's, like, handbag sale in their apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, that happened. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> How is your handbag line doing, by the way? It's, it's going well. I'm starting it next week. Kim Baker. Oh, yeah, yeah. Baker, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to divorce myself from that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're obviously used to seeing female correspondents on TV, you know, Christiane Amanpour, obviously in print. But it, I, I was trying to think of a movie that has a female war journalist as the lead. It's not a thing. It no, seems not, not to be a thing. How did I beat Angelina Jolie to this? <laughs> <laughs> seems like her kind of thing. No, she, has she done it? No. No, she hasn't. I don't think so. Um, and, and Tina, for you, you, as a producer of the film as well as the star, you felt like you wanted to bring a different kind of character to the screen, as you said, not just a magazine yeah. journalist, as needed as those people are in the yeah. world. Yeah. Um, and, and tell me why you felt like you needed to do that. Um, I mean, I just really, as I look to try to grow and learn how to be a producer, I, I look for stories, I, I try to make movies that I would want to see, that I myself would want to want to be there if I went to 68th Street. Um, and so that's really the guiding thing. It can kind of be anything. It can be a dumb movie like Sisters, dumb again in the best possible way. Um, <laughs> uh, or it could be something like this. And so, yeah, just, you know, uh, I think my friends and I, my comedy friends, Amy Poehler, Maya Rudolph, we all, you know, before there was a name for the Bechdel test, I think we all had sort of an internal version of like, this is, is this, movie stupid or not kind of thing and and so yeah I like to work on things where women are talking to other women and they have names and they're not just called like wife um, and stuff and you get your white male friend to write it you know? and then I get my white male friend to write it all comes together and then if I, that's how it gets done because I get scared <laughs> well you don't know computers and then I get my period and I don't feel good <laughs> Um, does it does it feel like does it feel like a leap for you? I mean, yeah. to be able to make a war comedy that we have that's not a kind of a genre of movie that we've seen in a while. Yeah, to have it have be led by a female character. Does it feel nerve wracking at all? It didn't feel like a crazy leap to me. Um, as we try to explain the movie and figure out how to market the movie, that's it's a hard because it does feel like a, a kind of movie that doesn't get made anymore. Robert sort of had an interesting observation. I should let you make about why people are sort of more uh, nervous about war comedies. Well, I don't think it was my episode. I was talking about it was this uh, I heard it Air Force buddy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the guys I, I spoke to before 
Kim told me that I was over-reporting and needed to start writing the, uh, the screenplay because it was just so fun to research this thing. But I was talking to a, a friend of mine in the Air Force who was asking the same question. He was saying, oh, some of my favorite, this is a genre. This is a thing that people have accepted in the, in the past. And why don't they do it more? And he was just talking uh, about perhaps the, the loss of that communal experience of service and, and that it does two things. One is that, uh, and these are his words, but this kind of um, deification of, of, of service where we then separate ourselves from that experience and from the humanity of the, of the people who serve. Uh, and then, of course, just the day-to-day, -day, oh, that's funny because I, I know that guy. I know who Major Major is in Catch-22 because I had that idiot um, as, as a commanding officer. Um, and I think one of the ways that we were in some ways able to do this movie was because the way into it was as a civilian and as a journalist, and journalists were allowed to make fun of journalists. We, it happens all the time, um, and I apologize. Um, <laughs> uh, and Because I, I don't think we could have made it as, oh, I'm, I'm a guy who's gonna, sign, gonna join the Marines because um, I want to change my life, and, and you know, not that that's why you did anything, but we do, our, we do need to boil this thing down. Right. Um, you know, I don't think we could have done that, um, and yet with Kim as a way in, uh, I think we're able to tell you know, the, the bigger picture. Hmm. Uh, and Tina, I should mention you, the film is dedicated to Tina's father who was a veteran. Yes. And a journalist early in his career. Yeah. And uh, tell, do you want to talk about the uh, scholarship? Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, yeah, my dad uh, uh, um, served in Korea. He was a code breaker in Korea actually, so he didn't see active duty, but he was real smart. And, um, and he uh, it's went to the Temple University School of Journalism and uh, and after he got back, you know, um, he started at Franklin and Marshall. I think his GI Bill ran out, and he had to go to Temple because he could get he could pay for it um, or something like that. But uh, and so uh, he passed away last October, and we, my family and I, set up a scholarship at Temple. Uh, specifically, it's a very specific scholarship, which I think is okay. Uh, specifically for uh, returning vets who might want to study journalism. Um, and so, if everyone could give me twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it is, if anyone's interested, it is uh, up and running at Temple. And um, I think it's uh, we've raised over $100,000 so far for it to be a ongoing uh, scholarship. Fund. And you know that guy. Yeah. Dave Boardman. Yeah. 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 But your administrative fees are crazy. Oh, you yeah. No, like I'm <laughs> definitely profiting on it. <laughs> Um, well, the other thing about being a journal, a female journalist in this world, is that sometimes you got away with things that male journalists didn't didn't get to do, right? Oh, what, what did I do? <laughs> no, I mean, like, I people always. It, it's funny, just like you know, Robert was talking about the deification of um, the experience, and I think like in in the West, people look at what happens over there, and if if there's ever anything like war, it's always really sad. <coughs> excuse me, sad and depressing, and people don't actually live their lives. And uh, women, they, similarly, I'm asked all the time, what was it like to be a female reporter? That must have been really hard. Um, must be really difficult to be a female reporter over there. And I always point out, like, mo most of the best journalists over there are women. And you get this sort of access to the women that, of course, male reporters aren't going to have because it just it doesn't work that way. And they will tell you their stories when they won't necessarily tell the stories to male journalists. And then, yeah, you get access to the men in a way that probably the male reporters didn't get. They were always curious to meet you. And, you know, it would had weird experiences happen, like, you know, the prime minister, the, well, he's now the prime minister of Pakistan, <laughs> but when he was the former prime minister of Pakistan before his, I think, his third term, I don't know, maybe it's his eighth at this point, now our Sharif did actually buy me an iPhone. And it was this really strange exchange. I mean, like, there was somebody in the audience who was actually, you know, contemporary. I'd be like, check out this text message from Dollar Sharif, you know. Um, and that probably wouldn't, it's not that I was getting away with anything, but I was certainly getting different sorts of attention, you know. Yeah. I mean, and that was something that I really loved about the book and about the character of Kim, if we can try to talk about it that way, but that two things, I think you said this to me once, two things that were seen by a lot of people as weaknesses, being a woman and having a sense of humor, gave you access, like, yeah. and I just love the idea of a turning it into a character who mm -hmm. ultimately realizes, oh, the, the ways in which yeah. this was especially terrifying are actually, I can use to my advantage. Yeah, 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 I was, I mean, because I think reporters, whenever they're talking to anybody and they're trying to get folks to trust them, we're a sneaky lot, so we're always looking for something to get us close <laughs> to you. You know, it's like some, some, some people use sports, you know, some people use cats, and <laughs> I, 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 you know, some people, you know, they will. They will. They'll talk about cats. And, and I don't know much about cats, and I, I always just use a sense of humor, like, you know, um, to try to bond with people. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that cat tip. Right. <laughs> <In my future laughs> <movies>. We love cats. <laughs> um, let's watch one more clip for the movie. Excuse me. Hey, General, do you have a minute? Not now, Becker. It's just uh, the Taliban haven't been destroying the well here. The women of the village are destroying it, or so they tell me. We dug that well several times for the women so they don't have to walk to the river. But they want to walk to the river. It's their only chance to be social and gossip and, you know, hang out. I think that they have a bunch of old Soviet landmines and they just prop one up and throw rocks at it. Kim, did you ever feel like you're manning that toll gate and the engineer's yelling, I got pig iron, I got pig iron? No, I don't know what that means. But it's very folksy. Also, uh, the women, obviously, they don't want the men to know about this, so they are hoping that you would just refuse to repair the well this time. Well, they're, they're in luck. That's exactly what I told the Mullah, so. <laughs> well done, Baker. I, I just imagine that Billy Bob Thornton talks like that all the time, does he? <laughs> in, in, in folksy, uh, Aphorisms, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, let's talk a little bit about that, that dual life that we mentioned earlier that, that, Kim, you got to lead and that you were so good at putting on screen in the movie. People don't realize that when you're doing this kind of work, this incredibly stressful, intense work, at the end of the day, you're not just you know cowering under your covers probably, right? You're, no, you're, <laughs> you're not. I mean, like, <laughs> no, and you can't go for a run <laughs> outside, and you can't like go to the gym to blow off steam. And my mother was always like, why don't you just do some yoga? And I was like, you do yoga, mom. I'm just going to go to the party. I mean, it was like, you, you know, let's face it. You throw a bunch of expats into these situations that are extremely stressful. You're co covering very stressful stories. You know, you're covering women who'd rather throw acid on themselves than be forced to marry a 60-year-old man. Um, you're covering suicide bombings. And when you're dealing with that sort of stuff and also just like doing the day-to-day, -day, the grind of going around, and you can't really walk down the street by yourself. You, you live a very sort of constricted, restricted life. And yeah, there were parties. And I think that it, it happens um, in every single conflict zone, there's always like the bar that everybody, every journalist will say, it's like the Star Wars bar. You know, <laughs> conflicts going all the way back to Star Wars. I've got Star Wars bar bar bars. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that was a long time ago, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Star Wars. Far, yeah. far away, yeah. Yeah, 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 it was. <laughs> and, um, and so, <laughs> going back to Beirut at least. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it was like, yeah, we drank and we had parties. Um, and it was always like a struggle to try to get alcohol. You know, that's one thing in the movie. You know, they show people sort of like wasting alcohol in the, in the movie. And I'm like, no, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be people pouring liquor or pouring it out. Because it's like Impression. you'd go to a restaurant there and like a $6 bottle of um, Jacob's Creek would cost like $45. Um, <laughs> but one of the reasons I wanted to show this sort of scene and the party scene and the fact that there were these restaurants that catered only to foreigners, because you could only go there if you're a foreigner because uh, they had alcohol, was I just felt like it was part of like how we just missed Afghanistan, you know, and how strange it was to be, to be living this lifestyle in this country you know, and a lot of folks in, in, in would be having these jobs where they were earning like, you know, half a million, $300,000 a year. They weren't journalists, but they're making it because they're co contractors or they're consultants. And they don't even know any Afghans. And so I kind of had to put myself in the middle of that party scene. Otherwise, I would have been a hypocrite. And I'm your guide through this. You know, very much I'm your guide into all these different parts um, of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And for Tina, you got to play that stuff out on screen, which yeah. seems fun. And it also led you to have some romantic scenes, which we don't often see you get yeah. in movies. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Uh, I, I mean, the party it. stuff, the, to shoot those party scenes is, it, it is a, uh, it's funny to shoot because a lot of times, I mean, you're drinking like white grape juice and like colored water or water. And then, but you've told like, just go in and just like, you know, hit it hard to be dancing, act like, you know, you've been partying for 12 hours. And uh, then you take a break and go outside and are reminded that it's like 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you started the shooting this at 7. Um, but it's, it's sort of fun to do. Uh, Kim has pointed out there's a lot more cocaine in the movie, I guess, than, uh, than they would have had. But we do, we get a tax break when we work with the Cocaine Growers Association of America. That's a film industry thing. Um, you just put their logo at the end. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
brought to special you. consideration from the cocaine growers of America. Um, but uh, yes, I do. I, Robert knows me a long time and knows that the only way I would ever sort of agree to do any kind of um, scene, a romantic scene like that, uh, sex scene, for lack of a better word, um, <laughs> is if it's a comedic scene. Because there's just, I'm not going to do that for real. This is not, <laughs> not enough money in the have. world. I never have, and Off I camera. never will. <laughs> Off camera or on. Um, <laughs> But there is hopefully, what hopefully is a comedic scene in the movie where after months of Kim holding out and not kind of hooking up with people, she finally does and is like a little overly aggressive and, and with a guy that she really actually hates this guy. <laughs> like, it's, just, it's like, just do it, just shut up. Um, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. Robert, was that the funnest scene for you to write? It was fun to write because I, I, yeah, I thought, I knew she'd go for it because she's fearless. Um, that wasn't the most fun scene to write, no. Uh, it, but it was fun to imagine making her do it. I don't know. Also, uh, having, a, uh, having a having a sort of a brother sister relationship with Robert for nearly twenty years, I was like, oh, by the way, you cannot be there when we shoot anything remotely like, like this. Thank so you. Robert would <laughs> Robert would ad adjourn to the hotel uh, on those days. <laughs> to the gym. <laughs> Kim, what was your experience like when you went on set? I mean, obviously this whole process is kind of surreal for you. Yeah, it's really surreal. <laughs> um, I mean, I went on set for a couple days last March. I was hoping they would invite me out for the party scenes because then I could be an extra, you know, because I'm familiar with how to do a journalist at a party. Um, but I was out there for some of the, ex uh, the military stuff and the explosions, uh, one of the explosions in the movie. And um, I went there thinking it was going to be really exciting. And... Um, you know, that it, I, was, I was so excited, it was gonna be exciting, and it like, turns out, um, like every journalist, I've got a short attention span, <laughs> and they shoot the same thing over and over again, and at a certain point, I'm like, you've got it, you had it like in take three, and you know, and I think the entire day, it's like they get one minute of footage out of it, mm -hmm. um, and, and then, then they seem to eat all day, it's like you start out, <laughs> I did, yeah, I'm, I'm serious, you start out, and they're like, here's your egg white burrito at eight, and then at 10, they're just like, here's your eggplant wrap, and like, noon, it's your Indian buffet, <laughs> <laughs> 3 p.m. they're like pizza and then you know they're like another buffet at six and then one one of the days I was there it was like you know it was about eight and they were going like late into the night and I said I think I'm gonna I think I got this you guys are gonna shoot this over and over again and like it's been great being here and everybody was so nice to me and so respectful really kind and uh and and Tina's like well you can't you can't leave yet because the grilled cheese truck is coming. <laughs> more food coming <laughs> were you there the day that we were shooting with some PJs, who are these uh, Air Force Special Forces guys? Were you there that day? And they came, they had just been out in the desert camping for like three weeks. They'd just gotten back and they looked at the buffet and just revolted and just <laughs> made these giant plates of food and just laughed. <laughs> and they, said, I and they had I, the same kind of I'm, I'm you, a trained observer. Do you guys do this every day? <laughs> I'm a trained observer. I did not notice that. <laughs> <laughs> May not have been a day. Yeah, there. yeah, exactly. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of representation and casting, because obviously that's been a kind of a flashpoint uh, recently. And Tina, you and I talked about it a little bit already, the idea that you cast uh, Alfred Molina to play an Afghan character and Christopher Abbott uh, to play an Afghan character. And I, I, I really liked what you had to say about that. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to talk well, about we, it. You know, we talked about this the other day. Uh, um, Melina said, no, how, how, we were having an interview on the phone. She's like, how hands-on were you with casting? I was like, pretty hands-on. Is your next question going to be, is why is Chris Abbott not Afghan? And she laughed, and I was like, but is it? And she said, yes, it is. Um, uh, there's a wonderful casting director named Bernie Telsey uh, here in New York who did an, uh, an excellent job with the film. Um, and John and Glenn would go, the directors would go, and they had sessions with, for all the parts in the film, they would see, uh, I presume dozens and dozens of actors. And uh, when it came to the role of Fahim and, and to Sadiq, I, I, I sort of said to them, guys, I, I beg you to be thorough, and I beg you to please look uh, to find an Afghan person, um, if you can. And, uh, and then I came in towards the end, and I would read with the sort of two or three finalists for, for these major roles. And you know, we came down to it, and there was a, two guys up for the role of, of Fahim, and, and Chris Abbott was won the role. He won it fair and square. Um, and I did sort of saying to John and Glenn, I was like, okay, guys, are you sure about this? Are we sure about it? And we looked, we looked for a long time for a, 
funny, you know, actor. And I'm not to say that that person is out there. Obviously, there, of course, there is a person uh, of that ethnicity who could could uh, play that part. But in the 2015, in the pool of actors in New York City that Bernie Telsley very, very diligently searched through, these were the best people for the role. I mean, I tried to. Uh, I did say to John and Glenn, like, guys, I hope you're sure because I'm telling you, a year from now, the only person who will get in trouble for this is me. Because <laughs> that's what I do for a living, is get in trouble on the internet. <laughs> um, and so they were like, and John and Glenn were like, it'll be fine. I'm like, you yeah, know, I know it's going to be fine for you guys. <laughs> but, um, but I do think that, that uh, Alfred and, and, and Chris are excellent in their roles, and they won them fair and square. And, uh, you know, and I try to try to make myself feel warmer about it and the fact that, uh, you know, it's, these are, Afghans are Caucasians. It's Caucasians playing Caucasians, you know. Uh, in, if you really wanted to go the mat on it, you could say it's not any different than, than you know, an Aussie playing a Brit, um, except I'm sure people feel that it is, but there you go. Well, I think the idea of, represent, of, of trying to get representation to be fair on screen is just that, it's trying. Yeah. And, and uh, I can tell from talking to you about it a couple of times that, yeah. that you've done it. And the other part of uh, the film that is so great is, as we were talking about before, the idea of representing a woman who is, who is capable but imperfect. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that was, comes from the book. Epitaph. <laughs> <laughs> capable but imperfect. Capable but imperfect. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's like, uh, you know, I wanted to portray myself. I think a lot of books by foreign correspondents uh, in war correspondence, it's like you've got like the journalist as hero almost, and like the all-seeing journalist who never makes a mistake, and smartest person in the room, and sort of omnipotent and looking back. Um, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do a funny book and darkly comic, and you couldn't do that either by making fun of Afghans and Pakistanis, or you know, which I do take. I do that with leaders, definitely. Um, for the hair, for the hair, and, <laughs> and the yeah, contour blush, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about what's coming in season two? And then we have some audience questions, which sure. I have been Do you want to start season two, Rob? Season two uh, is a continuation of this weird woman's journey of, of not losing her optimism and, and the strength that got her through this horrible experience while still figuring out what the world is. Uh, 